Joining us after another impressive series of quick hits and interviews in Anaheim for UFC 270. We can't wait to get into the interesting outcomes of today's UFC 270 pay-per-view. Laura Sanko, who, by the way, survived an end-of-the-world GDA uh, situation. <laughs> Donuts everywhere. It was Robocop, and she made it through alive to make this post. So, Laura Sanko, thank you so much for surviving that experience to join us here today. You're welcome. It was bizarre. I've never had anything like that happen to me in my life. Apparently, it's a thing here in L.A. Just... Um, <laughs> Uh, hoodlums get together and they do donuts in the middle of an intersection just relentlessly with people hanging out of the car i don't know but they stop traffic for like 20 minutes <laughs> just interrupting the post show as you do uh you should have given them the line it reminds me of that scene from the first fast and the furious where they're doing the burnouts and they're like find another way pizza boy i wish uh, somebody gave him one of those exactly you know people have places exactly. to go you know exactly. th things to do all right we're not going to waste any time, and I'm going to come in super hot. It was a very, very uh, interesting, to say the least, main event between Francis Ngannou and Cyril Ghan with Francis retaining the title. But here's a question for you, Laura. If Ghan doesn't go for that heel hook, are we now looking at a new heavyweight champion right now? That is, I mean, you hit the button on the, uh, you, you hit, this is what happens when you talk to me at one o'clock in the morning, <laughs> by the way. You hit the nail on the head. That's what I was trying to get it to. Um, yes. I think so, if I'm being honest. Um, it's debatable, of course, but that was a that was a critical mistake on Cyril Gon's part to give up that position and go for a heel hook. And it, in some ways, a, a kind of a green move, right? I mean, it's always position over submission, unless you are a submission specialist and you can you can make those adjustments, but. He gave up the position, and Francis Ngannou defended delightfully. I mean, he did such an effective job of shutting down the heel hook. I mean, there was there were opportunities for uh, a knee bar, if I remember right. I mean, Francis, I think, I don't know if it was DC or Joe Rogan that said, that said it, but it was the way he delivered it was so funny. He said, he's like, Francis Ngannou is doing jujitsu. Yeah. And yeah. Just, just, like, just laid out like, yeah, he is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. Good. I mean, we saw Francis Mega Madoff in there. And by the way, that was that that is the hashtag right now on Twitter going around. Um, you, you spoke to him in your quick hits and it was very yeah. fascinating just that you guys had such a great interview and he broke down the fact that and I just want to quickly highlight that, you know, his knee was so messed up. They were like an inch away from not actually going ahead with the fight. How impressed are you with the fact that he took this chance on himself? Not only was it with his contract, but with the fact that he was so compromised to go in there. And also, are you impressed with the fact that he actually wrestled on a knee like that? That's another. That's something else that we don't see very often, somebody with a knee injury like that actually going in for the wrestling. The whole situation is mind blowing. Now that we know what was actually going on, because people need to remember, this is not just this is not just any fight. First off, this is a heavyweight title fight. He is a defending champion who is in the middle of some very, which are clearly now tense contract negotiations. A lot being, I'm sure, dangled and uh, threatened probably behind the scenes. And to be able to bet on yourself in a situation where you know that you are going into a fight with a disadvantage against a very, very technical, excellent striker and a guy who moves a lot. I mean, it's not just that I was impressed that he went for the wrestling. I'm just impressed he showed up for the fight because mm. regardless of whether he planned to wrestle or not, Cyril Gaon is a guy that you have to be able to cut laterally. You have to be able to cut off the octagon to find him, to land the power shot that Francis Ngannou, I mean, it, that that's his kill switch. So it's it's, amazing to me that he went ahead and took this fight and doubled down on himself and believed that despite having, I mean, not just a slightly compromised me. I mean, cause we'll talk about, oh, so-and-so had an injury going to a fight. This was a legitimate, my understanding is that he was getting medical advice. You should not fight. Mm. Uh, and so to go and do this and take this chance and seize the moment. And as you say, Go to the wrestling, unbelievably impressive. Because wh whether you're whether you're pushing laterally, whether you are you know trying to 
stick your feet into the canvas to generate power or whether you go into the wrestling knees are very important in MMA. <laughs> That's the mm-hmm. takeaway here in every in, in, in every part of the game. So, yes, it is. It's a testament to his belief in himself and his mental strength to be able to make that walk knowing everything that was at stake tonight. Yeah, well, it's kind of the story of Francis' whole life, right? Like, you know, yeah. enough has been made of his insane, insane backstory and the way he's, you know, crossed countries and, and, and continents, you know, even just to be here. Like, it's almost like he he fought destiny. He shouldn't be in this position. He shouldn't be famous or, you know, rich or anything like that. And he mm-hmm. overcame everything, right? And then in this fight, it's like Cyril looked fantastic in the first couple of rounds. He was styling on Francis. He was making it look easy. After round two, you just felt like you were in for more of the same and then francis all of a sudden whipped out the uh, you know ncaa credentials and just turned the fight and i think even francis admitted to you that he was a bit like shit this isn't going my way and he was a little bit frustrated yeah. he found confidence in his excellent team of you know dewey cooper and eric nixick uh, shout out to obviously those guys and you know obviously he's in uh, i was gonna say endurance but his durability is just insane as well to take some of those shots from cyril and just keep going uh, unbelievable and like you mentioned like it just felt like the world against Cyril, uh, sorry, against Nganu in this one with, you know, the contract negotiations and Fernand and Gan being the, the the favorite going in here. But just, you know, to appreciate Gan for a second or, or look at him, do you think this might be in some ways one of the best things in his career? In in, all, in some ways, it's almost like Nganu's lost to Stipe in 2018 and now look where he is. Do you think we might be looking at a similar situation for Cyril down the line? Absolutely. I think sometimes we forget how young Cyril Ghosn is in this sport. When he fought Junior Dos Santos, he had been doing MMA two years, not in the UFC two years, not fighting professionally two years. He had been doing MMA for two years. The reality is that Cyril Ghosn is a very young fighter in this sport. So for him to even be in this position speaks to the athleticism, speaks to the skill, speaks to the technique. But you have to have these moments uh, to learn the tough lessons. And I, I, of course, think that in a situation like this, he's going to come away a better fighter. And I, I think your analogy is perfect. You know, the 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 Francis that we saw evolve since the first Stipe fight um, is only here because of that fight. And when you think about it, it's really scary to think <laughs> how much better... Cyril Gong could potentially become given the incredible skill set that he already has because he is already he's already a freak athlete in this division. He already has an incredible skill set. And the fact is, if Francis could not have gotten his wrestling game going, as you said, the 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 beginning of this fight was, I think, what a lot of the analysts imagined the whole fight potentially could be. If Francis mm. couldn't find Cyril, that's what we were in for. It's just that no one had any idea what was, you know, what was in Francis's back pocket and that he'd be willing and able to use it. And it's interesting because even for someone who doesn't have that much experience with the grappling, you know, Cyril still looked all right. It was just the decision making. And obviously the fact that he hadn't been in some of those positions, maybe in fights before, that really sort of made him make maybe the wrong choices. But you could just see with a little bit of training, the right kind of strategies and a grappling IQ to go along with his amazing uh, striking IQ. This guy is going to be an absolute beast. What did you think of Dana White not being in the octagon to put on the belt around Francis Nagano's waist? Pretty surreal. I knew you were going to ask me about that, and obviously these are waters I tried carefully. Oh, um, yeah. I was, surprised. <laughs> I was, I was surprised. I think it's very fair to say that everybody was surprised, mm. and uh, you know, it's. I'm. I was trying to remember. In fact, I was talking to someone backstage. I know that this has happened before because I want to say I've seen Sean put a belt. On somebody, well, but this, this happened with Stipe, UFC 220, when Stipe beat I, Francis and all the promotion was behind Francis, Stipe won. And then obviously there were some tense things between Stipe and the UFC and then similar situation. It, 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 it's so poetic how now it's happening with Francis. It is. It is. But what we have to remember, you know, these are, I don't know, they're negotiation moves, right? They're, they're posturing. And... What I kind of love, I don't know, maybe I don't love it, but what's kind of nice at times is as as tense as things can seem, they come back around. And, you know, Stipe seems to have a good relationship with the UFC. I remember when Dana White, when Dana went off on Amanda Nunes for having to pull out of 
the title fight when she had a sinus infection and said something like, she'll never, you know, she'll never <laughs> headline a card again. John Jones as well. He'll never headline a card yeah, again. I mean, I, I get all of this to say, I, I don't think it's like, oh gosh, Francis and the UFC will never get along. Francis and Dana will never get along. Because I think the story of them ending up at dinner together is a real story. So I don't know that the tension is necessarily even with Francis as a person or Francis as a fighter. Negotiations are tough and they're difficult, but once they're done, they're done. And then everybody gets to move forward. And I really, really hope that that is the case. Cause I can't imagine a scenario where Francis is gone. Who's not in the UFC, especially now. Mm, oh yeah. hundred percent, especially after this fight. Uh, just quickly, before we talk about what's next for Francis and who would be the ideal opponent, uh, pay-per-view prices have gone up for the UFC but not in Australia. So with one touch of a button, if you've got a VPN like NordVPN, you can change your virtual location to make your computer, TV, or anything, or your internet to think that you're in a different country like Australia. And that way you can pay for pay-per-view or watch fights or you know stream things legally, but for a cheaper price. Who doesn't love that? The same thing applies with streaming services such as Netflix or Disney Plus or Stan or Hulu, or any streaming service where you have different kind of content for different kind of regions. Uh, I was trying to watch Spider-Man Homecoming the other day with my girlfriend and they didn't have it anymore on Australian Netflix. Changed to a different Netflix in a different part of the world. All of a sudden, Spider-Man Homecoming. Uh, can't go wrong with NordVPN. Obviously, the amazing speed, thanks to Nordlinks, you got access to over 59 different countries by changing your virtual location with one touch of a button. Stream securely. Don't let anybody see or watch what you're going on on your browser history. NordVPN, the best, isn't it, Dennis? Yeah, man. And there's a 30 day money back guarantee if NordVPN is not for you. So there's no risk. Go to nordvpn.com forward slash submission or click the link below. Use code submission. Get up to 70% off your NordVPN plan plus one additional month for free. Do it today. There's no risk. Change your online life forever. Thanks to NordVPN and the code word submission. But Cass, I mean, we have seen some crazy fights today. I mean, we're breaking it down with Laura right now. And I know a lot of you guys made some serious money thanks to my bookie. A lot of people jumped on and doubled their first deposit with a code word submission. So my advice for everybody listening right now is don't miss out on any of the other big fights coming up. We've got UFC 271, UFC 272 right now. And it's never too early to jump on and check out what kind of bets you can make. UFC 272 main event odds for Covington Mazadal are up right now. Mazadal at plus 255. Covington minus 330. You guys can jump on right now and plan out all your bets at my bookie with the code word submission. Double that first deposit today. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with our friends at my bookie cast. Yeah, no, anybody who bet on Naganu winning by decision, holy shit, you are a rich man right now. Uh, <laughs> by the way, Valentine's Day is around the corner, gentlemen, and training camp starts right now. Get your junk in check, get the black belt. Uh, of grooming with the Manscaped uh, Lawnmower 4.0, the best grooming tool, the pound for pound greatest grooming tool uh, in the world. Former sponsor of One Francis and Garnu as well, so you know they're in good company. 7,000 of pure RPM power, the skin safe technology, so you never cut your balls. You've got different guards for different lengths and textures. LED light, it's waterproof, so you can smash it out in the shower. Uh, travel lock, so it doesn't go off in your bag. Wireless charging dock, you just shave. You can shave anything, your arms, your back, whatever you want, your ear hair, and then you just move on with your life and uh, make sure that you don't turn Valentine's Day into Independence Day. Uh, have fun. That's what you want to do. And if you get the performance package 4.0, you get the lawnmower, you get the weed whacker, ear and nose hair trimmer. You also get the crop preserver ball deodorant and the crop reviver ball toner to make sure your boys down there are always smelling fresh. You get free underwear and you get a free bag. What's not to love? Isn't that right, Dennis? Man, I know that everybody right now in Australia, especially in Melbourne, is thanking the law that they jumped on the Manscaped bandwagon and use the code word submission, got 20% off and free shipping because it is so hot right now. Mm. Let's send the aircon off to, to shoot this thing. And I can already think about that Manscaped toner later on after this because I, I reckon I'll be sweating it out and stinking out the household if it wasn't for Manscaped. So jump on today. It's Manscaped, code word submission, 20% off and free shipping. Get with it, get ready for summer, get ready for training, thanks to Manscaped. But Laura, if we're looking at it and uh, we get all the negotiations out of the way, because who knows what's going to happen with the whole thing next, and just look at things right now. 
What would you like to see next for Francis Nagano? If you can factor in the boxing, if you can factor in all the MMA stuff, all the potential opponents that he's got in the UFC, who's the number one person that stands out to you that you'd like to see him fight next? Oh, man, I mean... I- Surely this pours water on a Tyson Fury fight. Not that that was super likely anyway, but just after yeah. the, the, the way it played out, people aren't exactly clamoring for like, oh man, mm. and Garnu and Tyson, we got to see that. No, yeah, I don't. I don't think the boxing move is the right move. I think he needs to. I think he needs to stay here, and he he has the potential to be one of the greatest champions in UFC history. The, the heavyweight championship has a tendency to churn because it's it's such a it's a division that that is that is played on you know just a hair's edge because everybody has the ability to have that one punch knockout power but francis is special and there's no denying that so he has the potential to be a very long reigning champion if that is what something that he wants to do so as a fight fan that is what i want that's what i want to see and i would love to see this new crop of you know of heavyweights climbing the ranks make their way and have him, you know, kind of sitting at the the top of the mountain defending his territory. Yeah, I feel like when you look at the guys who are in contention at heavyweight, I mean, you've got Derek Lewis, who's just like a permanent fixture in, in the title picture <laughs> at a heavyweight. So we, we could always do that rematch. You've got Tom Aspinall yeah. and uh, Volkov. I mean, I the Tom, winner. Tom Aspinall is who came to mind. Yeah. I mean, if it's not those guys, it could be John Jones, even though that you know, obviously that fight was so easy to make in the, in the beginning. It'd be hilarious if that's the next fight. I almost feel like Garn at this point is still the favorite of, you know, if you had to pick anybody to beat Francis, it's probably still Garn, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> and I think especially after, especially after this performance, because, because of what you pointed out, I mean, he made just one tactical error that really could have changed the scorecards. But if you if if he had come into this fight knowing that Francis was going to go to the wrestling, I don't know. I, this fight could potentially be a very different looking fight a second time, as you know, rematches tend to be, and then you build up the trilogy, and we could we could see Cyril versus Francis for <laughs> the next few years, mm. and I wouldn't mind it. Mm. One more thing, just on the whole negotiations thing. Obviously, one thing that uh, people have been talking about is that in January of 2023, it seems like the contract will be officially up. It can't go any longer than five years. If that is the fact, do you see a scenario where Francis waits the year? Because you got to think if he waits that long, he's probably going to be stripped, right? Yeah, I, I can't see him sitting around that long and just remaining the champion and having all the leverage. So you got to think he's going to take a fight before that, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I mean, that. We've seen, uh, historically speaking, that they're willing to make shifts and moves and create interim champions in order to sort of, you know, force the title picture and and make sure that the top of that division is moving along and that there's not, you know, someone sitting there just sort of holding on to the belt. So, yeah, I I think that that would be the case. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy times. And I know in the post-fight press conference, he was mentioning that he's keen to sit out (laughs) <laughs> and wait for the contract to be over and done with. But I just think it's just such a shame to see an athlete in his prime like he is missing out on an opportunity to fight. And it would be great if the UFC and him could come to some kind of resolution so we could see him fight. There's so many great oh. opponents. Just quickly as well, just with Stipe, what do you think should be next for him? Because a lot of people believe, I know Fernand Lopez was on the show earlier this week, said that he believes that there was another fight between Nagano and Stipe. Stipe would have a good chance of winning it. Where do you think he fits into this whole puzzle? I, listen, he's right up there. I, I think, I, I mean, I almost said Stipe. That's why I paused so long because it's a very tricky situation at the top of that division. And I think for Stipe, I, I wouldn't mind I wouldn't mind him getting the next title shot. I wouldn't mind that at all. He's, I think he's earned it. He's one of the greatest UFC champion, heavyweight champions uh, that we've had. And yeah, a trilogy, a trilogy between those two would be would be a very interesting matchup. I wouldn't mind him him versus Tom. That'd be fun. That'd be a fun fight. Um, but I think he's earned, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm completely undoing what I just said like 30 seconds ago, <laughs> but it's either for Francis, it's either has to be Cyril or Stipe. I think maybe Cyril first and then Stipe and Stipe, Stipe fights Tom. I don't know. Mm. This is why I don't have job guys this is, i'm not a matchmaker <laughs> i like it i like it no, no, no. I, would, I would i would sit in my office and, and all day and just go but oh but maybe but then oh 
it would just be indecision all over the place. ESPN Twitter, it's like, Laura Sanko changed her mind. Title fight is off. <laughs> <laughs> and, <yeah>. Brett Okamoto <laughs> would would not know what to do. He'd be announcing fights, then unannouncing fights in, in, in the same day, in the same hour. Um, just quickly before we move on to the co-main event, what is Francis Ngannou doing to celebrate? I was watching your quick hits and mm. it was just this comedic editing where you're like, what are you doing to celebrate? And am yeah. I invited? And he's like, well, I will. And then it just cuts to like the credits music. And then it comes, oh, uh, then, it. then it has John Jones on the screen saying, come to daddy. And then it just comes <laughs> back and you and Francis are laughing. And I was like, what was that? What, what, what was that? Oh, what is he doing weird. to celebrate? They must have had some sort of technical issue. I, didn't I think even, they were I ready to rap and then they hit the, the credits thing and they were like, oh shit, there's more. We got to go back. <laughs> no, what was really funny was he he very he had this like really deadpan humor and he said um something like my reward for the good fight is I go back to my room and I rest and I meditate. <laughs> and I was like <laughs> Surely he doesn't mean that. I like, wouldn't know how to take that if I was you. And he said that. I didn't know how to take it. And I was like, really? You're not going to go rip up LA? That's what I would, you know? And I'm like, I'm kind of looking over at Dewey, like, is he joking? <laughs> you know? And he's like, meditation is the reward. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so it was a very confusing thing. But I think he was being funny. Yeah. Mm, either, that, either that or stuff. doing burnouts in LA. Yeah, that was, that was the internet card. This makes so much more sense now. Yes. Okay, let's talk about the co-main. Obviously, very close fight between Moreno and Figueredo. What did you when after the, when the fight was finished before they were going to read out the scorecard? Did you feel like Figgy had won it, Laura, or did you, did, did you part of you think that Moreno might have edged I it out? I knew you were going to ask me this, of course. Mm. And the reality is, I didn't know. Um, I think. Because I didn't know, I felt Moreno would get it just because we have this idea that like, oh, you got to really, you know, take it from the champion. Although that's not a real thing. They don't teach that mm. in judging school. Um, but yeah, I, I think as I was sitting there, I, I, I guess I did. I sort of expected it to be Brandon Moreno's. But then when I go back and I, I haven't, I really would have loved to have had the time to rewatch the fight before we had this discussion. Um, because the reality is so many of the rounds were very, very close. Mm. Um, and I, I honestly couldn't tell you right now how I scored each individual round because I'm watching it when I'm watching it, uh, I'm watching it with an interview in mind. So I really have to go back and watch the fight again. Um, but I'm certainly not, I'm not surprised or upset that Davis and Figueredo got it. It was extremely, extremely close. It was a very fun fight. I think the fifth round kind of sealed it for Figgy and it was like Moreno was doing fantastic. He would just wear, you know, eat these shots and wear them and keep coming. And I felt like Figgy wasn't wearing them quite as well, but then he would drop Moreno and then he would kind of steal him the round. And that's kind of what got him in there. It, it almost seemed like at times he was getting a bit tired. Maybe the weight cut was taking its toll, but then he just hung in there and showed that championship, you know, mentality and grit. I mean, is it safe to say this, this is a, a no brainer that they're going to do a fourth one now is is that the fight that you would like to see next and and you know set a, set a record for the ufc for the first quadrilogy quadrilogy yes yes we even get to make up a new word um yeah it is the fight i'd like to see uh, these two i think i said it to davison in our in our interview it, these two have really defined what the flyweight division has been about is all about and and i think are setting the precedent for the future of the flyweight division because You've got two guys who are so closely matched, two fighters who are so well rounded that we've seen it. You know, every time they fight, we're getting a different, a slightly different outcome. And so there has to be a bigger population to pull from to get a real answer. Because, I, you know, that's the end of the, at the end of the day, fighting is about answering the question who is, who's the better guy? Who would win in like an actual street fight? Who would win in a real fight? And the more times you fight, the closer you get to answering that mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. And we need another we need another fight to get actually closer to answering that question because tonight it it, it was Davis and Figueroa, but by a hair, mm. by a hair. And last fight, it was Brandon Moreno decisively, and before that. It was Davis and Figueredo decisively minus the point deduction. So 
they're just, they're so evenly matched. And I love what they have done for the flyweight division because everyone was glued to that fight and they should have been. And it, they've they've reignited what it means to be a flyweight. Bit of a chess match, little changes made in every fight and affecting yeah. the outcome. But, you know, the fourth fight would be great. But, you know, if Kaio Esco win as well, man, he was talking about a Kai fight, Kai Kaio France fight, Figgy was, and, and talking about what that fight would look like. And, man, that would be one hell of a fight and huge for the New Zealand market too. So a lot of exciting things happening in the division. I just got to quickly mention Jack Della Maddalena with an impressive first round TKO win. And, I mean, this is a guy that was the eternal champion here in Oz. And this guy's going to be a problem for the welterweight division. So great to see big things happening for the Australian market as well. Laura, as we wrap up, all your fans very excited for the one-on-one -on -one project that's coming out oh, soon. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I know that obviously they can follow you at Laura underscore Sanko, but just quickly on Twitter and Instagram, but just quickly, what can we expect from this coming up project? Yeah, I'm really excited about it. It just it just launched, um, I think, a, a two days ago, and I'm I'm doing it in partnership with Bet365. And what I love about that is they are partnered with the UFC outside of the United States, so um, we still get to use all the footage from the UFC. Which I think when you're doing breakdowns, mm. when you're doing top ten lists, I mean, being able to use UFC footage is pretty critical. Mm. So uh, I'm really excited to be partnered with them, and they are therefore partnered with the UFC. And uh, it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be putting out content, I think, three times a week. A lot of top ten lists, a lot of uh, interviews uh, with different fighters, breakdowns before every pay per view card, and then a lot of one off content. Like I did a great uh, behind the scenes tour of the PI, the new um, additions that they've made, and um, got Forrest Griffin's you know VIP tour there. Just mm. things like that that uh, that I think fans would really enjoy seeing and. The first breakdown went up, went up the other day, and I, I'll say I hope people go watch it, but it will improve from there. I mean, it's just me sitting in a chair, so uh, I have a long way to go in terms of like a backdrop and and whatnot. But uh, the content's there, and I hope everybody appreciates it. Well, Figueroa giving you a haircut definitely for the next fight in Mexico. I would love to see it, and I think a red a red stripe, or maybe a red stripe, and maybe he can do like shaved it all down and stuff. I mean, you got to commit to these channels, Laura, and you got to put your blood in. To it, so do you it did the, the shoey. You did the shoey, so you're all about committing. Can't be much. Yeah, I mean, I did the shoey. Why not shave my head? It's, it's <laughs> virtually the same thing. What a what a great quote. You know, that's uh, going to be up on all the websites tomorrow. But guys, she's Laura Sanko. <laughs> we appreciate you. Thank you for surviving the end of the world to do this post fight show. And guys, make sure to follow her at Laura underscore Sanko on Twitter and Instagram. We appreciate you. Thank you so much.